Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Take a few moments and greet those around you. Say hello. Introduce yourself if you see a new face. Today is the second Sunday after the Epiphany, and in our Gospel lesson we see Epiphany continuing as Jesus reveals his glory. His disciples put their faith in him. We're also in the green season. Our altar cloths are changed to green, which is, symbolizes growth. And so we hear the teaching of Christ in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians as he teaches us about Christian love. Our opening hymn is number 375, Arise and Shine in Splendor. The order of worship is the service, setting one, beginning on page 154. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, 
I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who were offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your one and only Son to be the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and believed to the ends of the earth. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. The 
first reading is from the 62nd chapter of Isaiah. For the sake of Zion, I will not be silent. For the sake of Jerusalem, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth shining brightly and her salvation burns like a torch. Nations will see your righteousness and all kings will see your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will assign you. Then you will be a beautiful crown in the Lord's hand and a royal diadem in the palm of your God. You will never again be called abandoned and your land will never again be called desolation. For you will be called my delight is in her and your land will be called married because the Lord delights in you and your land will be married. For just as a young man marries a virgin, your sons will marry you. And just as a bridegroom rejoices over a bride, your God will rejoice over you. The word of the Lord. We continue with Psalm 145. This is a hymn version of a psalm, and it is a tune that is new to us. So please listen carefully as the tune is introduced.
The second reading is from the third chapter of Ephesians. This lesson will be the basis for today's sermon. For this reason I kneel before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the entire family in heaven and on earth receives its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he would strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner self, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Then, being rooted and grounded in love, I pray that you would be able to comprehend, along with all the saints, how wide and long and high and deep his love is, and that you would be able to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able, according to the power that is at work within us, to do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Three days later, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with you and me? My time has not come yet. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Six stone water jars, which the Jews used for ceremonial cleansing, were standing there, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus told them, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did. When the master of the banquet tasted the water that had now become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the banquet called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the guests have had plenty to drink, then the cheaper wine. You saved the good wine until now. This, the beginning of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Our next hymn, Jesus, Your Boundless Love to Me, is a very old text, but again, the the tune is new to us. Jesus, your boundless love to me, no thought can reach, no tongue declare, dwell in my heart. 
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dear children of God, dearly loved by him. Right after Christmas, I think it was on December 26th, one of my Facebook acquaintances put up a graphic with a nice background of paper red hearts that said, now, out with all the Christmas junk and in with all the Valentine's junk. And that's what we see in the stores, isn't it? It's still a month away, a little less than a month away from Valentine's Day, but it is always good to talk about the love of God and how it does its work within us. But first, we have to talk about that word love. In our time, but I think it's probably always been this way, that the word love is used to talk about a taking action rather than a giving one. I did an experiment with some of my catechism kids this week, I said, what's your favorite food? Oh, I love pizza. Oh, what kind? Domino's or Marco's or Pizza Hut? Pizza Hut! I love their deluxe. Anybody here like Chinese food? Oh, I love, I love honey glazed chicken with rice. You see a pattern 
in the way the word love is used. It's very easy to use the word love to talk about ways that we serve ourselves. And love of self is not really love at all, but selfishness. When we learned the first commandment in catechism class, you shall have no other gods, we learned Luther's explanation along with it. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. We can be pretty good at loving ourselves above all things. And that can lead to, well, some pretty tragic consequences. First, in this life, loving yourself above all ends up being very lonely. Loving self above all else, well, then that turns others off. And then loving self, even to the point where we put God in second place, well, that leads to an eternity apart from God and apart from anything good. But biblically, the word love describes a giving action. And emphasize that word action action more than feeling. Think of the most famous Bible verse of all. Do a little fill in the blank today. For God so loved the world that he gave. Or think of the time Jesus was with his disciples. They were arguing one of many times about which one of them was most important. And Jesus taught them and said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Or St. Paul wrote to the Romans, God did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all. This is the biblical use and definition of the word love, to give. And this is what we celebrated at Christmas. This is what we will meditate on during Lent. This is what we will celebrate again at Easter. God giving himself, God giving his only son, Jesus giving himself even to the depths, even to the depths of suffering. Why would God do this? Why would God look at a world of sinners and give anything to them? Why would God look at a world of sinners and give his dearest and best to them? Well, this is the essence of grace, God's undeserved love, where grace has also been described as one-way love, a love that gives without looking to see if the receiver is worthy first, despite the unworthiness God loves anyway. God's love is our root the roots of our faith, the root of our hope, and the power for our love. God's love is beyond measure. Paul prays for the Ephesians and he gets a little poetic. He says, I pray that you may be able to comprehend how wide and long and high and deep the love of God is. Our hymn writer today abbreviated that a little bit and simply said, Jesus, your boundless love to me, no thought can tell. 
no thought can reach, no tongue declare. Boundless. The Greek word that Paul uses for love in this whole section is that word agape, which describes a divine love and a selfless love. There are many other words in the Bible like that. I think especially of an Old Testament word, the Hebrew word that is sometimes translated as love, sometimes translated as faithfulness, the Hebrew word kesed. It's a word that is a love, describes love, but love with all the attributes that God himself has. God is eternal. His mercy endures forever. God is boundless. His love is high and deep and wide. Just as God himself is without limit. God is unchanging. His love is faithful and steadfast. When our small minds have problems with God's love, it's often on our end. God's love is boundless. Think of something like a water supply. If you turn on the faucet, you could let the faucet run forever. If you've got kids in the house, maybe sometimes that happens. God's love is boundless and would flow forever. Sometimes we are the ones turning off the faucet with our thoughts directed at self, like, I am too rotten for God to love me. I'm too far gone for any kind of redemption. Well, then that's us turning off the faucet. Or the love of God directed at others when we think that one person hurt me or embarrassed me so much that they're not worthy of my love or my forgiveness, well, that's really turning off the faucet on God's love too because God's love is supposed to flow through us. Our forgiveness is to be a reflection of God's forgiveness. God's love is beyond measure. And God's love is beyond understanding. Paul is so excited about the love of God as he writes to the, to the Ephesians that he says something that might seem like a contradiction, but he has a point that he's making with this. In verse 18, he said, I want you to be able to comprehend how wide and long and high and deep his love is, that you would be able to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. In other words, I pray and wish that you would be able to know the unknowable and comprehend the incomprehensible. Our small human minds can only grasp a fragment of the love of Christ. Kind of like Moses, wanting to see the full glory of God and only being able to see a reflection of it in the back of that cave. But God's love is beyond our knowledge and beyond our understanding. When we look inward, Again, we think, how can God love me with all my mistakes, with all my faults, for with all the times that I knew the right thing but did the wrong thing anyway? He loves anyway. It's beyond our understanding. And then when we look at the way God's love has been displayed to us, his action of love, 
put to work for us, well then, it far surpasses our understanding. We look at the Christmas manger, and there we see how the image, the the limitless God, the infinite God, contains himself in the form of a small child. Why would he do that? And he did that at his own great discomfort and at his own great risk. Straw and hay make lousy bedding for any child prickly, uncomfortable. And then we think of old Herod and what he tried to do when he heard about a newborn king of the Jews. Why would the Son of God come, take on human form to such lowliness, such poverty, such discomfort, and such risk for us and for our salvation. He did all this that we should be his own. That is the love of Christ beyond understanding, the love of Christ beyond our knowledge. Then we look at Good Friday's cross with the figure of Christ on it, nailed and pierced and beaten and bleeding and forsaken and condemned, why would the sinless Son of God come and get all this punishment that he didn't deserve? He did it to give you and me what we don't deserve. He did it to take everything that we deserved. He did it to bear our sin. He did it to give us everything that he has, a place in our father's family as his dear children. He came to make us heirs of heaven for us and for our salvation, that we should be his own. He came into a world of hurt and hate to demonstrate his love. God's love fills us and empowers us. Knowing the love of God is not supposed to be a a mere bit of trivia on our minds that we know or an academic thing, something we memorize and then we can recite it or write it on a test. That's not what's meant about knowing the love of God. I follow religious news stories and have seen numerous news stories about people leaving churches especially during the pandemic, but it's been a trend anyway. Maybe it's because people have felt this love of God is more a fact to know rather than a life to be lived. This is what Paul means by God filling us with all of his fullness. Does God's love Fill your life every day, even at work, even in some of the less pleasant things. God wants his love to fill you with all its fullness. We see what happens when the love of many grows cold instead. We look at our world. We see people pitted against one another when they don't need to be. The vaccinated against the unvaccinated, one political party against another, racial tensions, 
we need to remember God so loved the world. Even you and even them. Let it flow through you. Paul ends this lesson with a doxology, a word of praise. He says, to him who is able, according to the power that's at work within us, to do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. I think part of that is very familiar to us. God is able to do more than we ask or imagine. But I'm afraid we sometimes take that line, that phrase, in a selfish way. God is able to do more than we ask or imagine, so I should ask for big things so that I can get more from God. Yes, you can apply this passage to God's omnipotence and the way that he answers prayer, but this passage is very specific. St. Paul is being very specific when he says, according to the power that is at work within us, God can do infinitely more than we ask or imagine. Paul's applying this to God's love as the power that is at work within us. And through the power of his love, God can work a change within you that is beyond what you could ask or imagine. And as that love works in you, then it begins to work through you in ways beyond what you could ask or imagine. Then God fills us with all his fullness. He does work through us that we did not expect. This is the power and the love of God. And this is to his glory forever and ever. Amen. Please rise and we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page 163 in the front of the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the prayer of the church. The prayer of the church is on page three of the worship folder. In our special prayers today, we Rejoice with Bernie and Dory Nowicki on the occasion of their 68th wedding anniversary. Eternal Father, your only Son has made you known and has revealed your glory by his word and work. We will exalt you, O God, our King. Strengthen us inwardly by your Holy Spirit. Root and establish us in your love. Empower us with understanding as we grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We will praise your name forever and ever. Your Son revealed his glory at the wedding of Cana, and his disciples believed in him. Continue to reveal your glory as we share the word of your gospel that people may see the wonder of your love in Christ. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We will praise your name forever and ever. 
In the beginning, you established marriage to fill our need for companionship, to provide for all physical needs, and to establish the family as the foundation of society. Strengthen husbands and wives in commitment and love. Lead and teach children to honor, serve, obey, and love their parents. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We will praise your name forever and ever. We rejoice in the many liberties and freedoms you have given us in our land. The greatest of these is our freedom to worship you in spirit and in truth. Preserve our freedom of religion so that your word may be freely proclaimed for the building up and expansion of your church. We will exalt you, O God, our King. Uphold all who fall and lift up all who are bowed down. In your mercy, look upon those who endure pain and suffering. Have compassion on your people. Uphold them and strengthen them in faith. Give health and recovery as it fits your gracious plan for them. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We will praise your name forever and ever. Heavenly Father, we join Bernie and Dory Nowicki in giving thanks as they celebrate their wedding anniversary. By your grace, they have come this far, and by your grace, they move forward together. Strengthen and defend them through all trials and temptations. As they enjoy your gift of marriage, help them to love each other with selflessness and service. May they continue to find comfort in your presence, strengthen your promises, and perseverance through your faithfulness. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you the prayers from the depths of our hearts. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless all husbands, wives, and families that they may live and serve you in joy and unity and bring up their children according to your will. Provide for all their needs and comfort in all misfortune, crosses, and affliction. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue with hymn 611, Joyously I'll Praise My Savior.
Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. The annual report is available today. Please look for it on the table in the back by the TV. There should also be some on the table at the top of the ramp. Also today we begin a new Bible class series, Favorite Psalms. Uh, join us for the Word of God and for coffee and some other treats uh, starting in just a few minutes downstairs. God's blessings on your week. Stay warm, stay healthy. <laughs>